Hello and welcome back to English Language Teachers Under the Covers. Uh, today we have a very special guest. We have an English teacher with over a decade's worth of experience in half a dozen different countries. Uh, he has an MA in English Language Teaching along with a CELTA. He delivers a personalized English language course at EnglishCoachOnline.com. He's also an EdTech enthusiast working on Comified English Learning App. Welcome to the show, Steve Krajewski. Krajewski, great pronunciation. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> I try, I try. Um, so, Steve, please uh, take us back. Where did it start? Where did it begin? And uh, let's go from there. Yeah, thanks for having me once again. It began in the summer of 2006. Actually, I did a CELTA course in Krakow in Poland, popular tourist destination, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but I rather got into ELT by accident because I, I studied history at university. And then I met some guy at university who invited me on an adventure to Poland. Mm -hmm. And it all started from there. But I guess it was rather fate because I was rather interested in English at school. So uh, spelling was my thing, writing was my thing, creative writing. So I think... Mm -hmm. All of this came back to me in the end. I don't know what would have happened if I'd gone on to, to study history or become a history teacher in the UK. Uh, I think it, everything worked out in the end. Mm. I, don't, I don't think we've actually come across, I haven't actually interviewed one person yet who hasn't basically said they got into English language teaching by accident. Um, yeah, I don't think I've come across anyone who's like, yeah, I, I deliberately, like, I just, uh, like, I really just had this aim to get into English language teaching. So that's a, that's a fairly common thing. Um, this thing about uh, going on an adventure to Poland. So uh, you are you not Polish? I assume from your surname that you were. But my grandfather was Polish, actually. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, so it's almost, it was almost like a bit of a pilgrimage. <laughs> yes. Something like that, right? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I never had any contact with Polish people or, Pol or the Polish language for the first 18 years of my life, I guess. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've, I often get asked, am I Polish? Um, which can sometimes be quite annoying. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And actually it's probably held me back a little bit in this in this game, in the mm. world of VOT, because I think once when I applied for the jobs in the UK in 2011, I applied for perhaps 35, 40 jobs. After teaching a summer course in Southampton, I didn't get one response. And I think I could say back then in 2000, I was fairly well qualified. Yeah. Mm. I, yeah. I had quite a bit of it, but didn't get one reply. And probably the surname didn't help me. Mm. So, I, you know, I didn't cry about it. I didn't complain. I just accepted the mm. situation, probably went freelance after that. It's just the, the easiest route. If the, the employers are not going to have me, then well, mm. whatever, what can I do? It's not my fault. You know, I'm mm. proud of my roots and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, I mean, yeah. You could, I suppose you could always use a pseudonym, but then it's kind of an argument. Why should you have to? I suppose. Yeah, no, it's it's, you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to do anything like that. No, it's just it's just a, a an unfortunate byproduct of the industry. There, there's there is a lot of uh, you know discrimination. Is is pretty rife. Definitely yeah. with, with it within the industry, especially once you yeah. start moving outside of English speaking countries. Well, it, 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 it comes a lot from the customers, doesn't it? And especially parents of children. Uh, they're very keen to have someone who is a native and also not just a native, but someone who fits their idea of what a what a native is, which is a bit of a nebulous concept anyway. Um, but I think this I think this sort of discrimination is strongest when it's like someone with a name that sounds like they're from the country where they're trying to work. So if someone like seems like they're Spanish and they're trying to teach English in Spain, I think they find it really tough, actually, um, to, 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 to get work there. But then if they go outside of that kind of uh outside outside just anywhere really if they go to italy or germany or whatever to work as an english language teacher i think it doesn't really it doesn't tend to affect them as much so i'm surprised that you experienced that in in england but i don't have a great deal of experience with language schools in england so so i don't really know what 
what sort of uh, predispositions they might have. Yeah. In fact, it's just a coincidence. My latest blog post on English Coach Online did touch upon native speakerism and a native speaker fallacy. Mm. And of course, I express huge sympathy for non-native speakers who mm. apply for these jobs abroad. And I'm sure you've heard of the guy Marek Kichikoviak of Tefl Equity Advocates. You know, it's, it's no surprise that they, they do campaign. Uh, yeah. Personally, I accept the situation for what it was. You know, I'm not really into that. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the discrimination is everywhere, isn't it? You know, you're always going to, you're always going to find uh, one thing or another why someone is, uh, you know, might might hold some sort of thing against you rather than someone else, right? And we can't all look like Brad Pitt, for example, <laughs> and all the rest of it. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so, so sort of what happened next then after um, as you as you went on, how did how did uh, you kind of transition? to get more into sort of the ed tech side of things, which is definitely where you're focusing now, as far as I can tell. Yeah, ed tech, I think. Probably I was looking to, to broaden out a bit. I think it's never healthy if you do too much of one thing. Mm. Actually, it might be a bit of a side point, but I'm a huge fan of the snooker player, Ronnie O'Sullivan, <laughs> who, who talked of having a snooker depression because all he did was play snooker. Oh. Uh, and as soon as he t started to, to broaden out a little bit and do other things, then he started to enjoy playing snooker. Uh, mm. And I think doing 30, 35 hours of teaching per week in a language school, maybe we can't call it teacher depression, but it was too much. It's no surprise mm. that burnout occurs. And now a bit of this uh, ed tech, uh, a bit of blogging, who knows what might happen in the future with advertising. For now, it's, I like writing. But you never know what might happen and a bit of teaching of course for me it's a it's a nice combination but if you were to ask could i do 25 hours or 30 hours of teaching a week again i, I couldn't i think i'm at about perhaps 10 teaching hours right now 10 to 12 hours mm. 45 minutes if you, if you want to call that mm. a, a teaching session which for me works it's a nice balance yeah yeah, yeah uh, I, I, it, compl I completely understand what you mean with that uh, I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm still teaching uh, probably a similar amount of hours to you, uh, approximately yeah about about maybe twelve to fifteen a week depending on the week, and because of that it's really enjoyable and I, I agree with you I think if I kind of went back to, you know, full time teaching twenty five hours plus, it becomes much less of a passion and much more of a job. I agree with you. That that's right. Uh, in terms of ed tech. I never really thought about it, but I guess it all started when I browsed through uh, Duolingo one day. Yes, our old mates at Duolingo. Uh, and I've got some examples here, actually, because I think it's quite a reactionary approach I've got here with my application. Mm -hmm. There are things on Duolingo like, am I a girl? You know, these uh, typical translation drills, am I a girl? You are a woman. Right. I am not a woman. Right, right, right. Yeah. You are purpler than a Belgian candy. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember, I uh, remember, because I've done a few Duolingo courses and always the weird sentences, like they stick in my head and they're kind of really, yeah, they really odd, aren't they? Like I remember learning German and learning, was ist mit den Katzen bitte? Which is like, what's the problem with those cats? <laughs> 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 uh, and also in in Japanese, uh, lingo this, which it could be, it could mean something else, but kind of direct without any context, it means I'm an apple. So yeah, it's really odd, and it actually tells you to say that. It says like, how do you say in English, I'm an apple? And I remember one of them was, how would you ask, um, excuse me, are you an apple? Which would be like, Sumio saying. Ringo this car, right? It's like, what? I don't know where they get that from, though. It's supposed to be curated. It, is it algorithmical or, you know, like, do they use AI? I thought it was like they use capture technology. That, that was like 15 years ago, though. I'm pretty sure now they have, like, loads of editors and stuff. Oh, really? So. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of it. It looks like it's completely out of hand. Even... Grammar structures like the present simple, woman eats an apple, you, you would never say that. You would never mm. say it in the present continuous anyway. Mm. But yeah, I think comified is quite reactionary. And I think first of all, I wanted to get away from these newsy texts, third person texts. 
mm -hmm. uh, and get students into the first person. You know, these, I've written about 60 texts based on my own experiences from getting other native speakers involved. Uh, excuse me for my native speakerism again. But I think people do react to that. Students do react to, to the first person because they almost adopt the persona of that native speaker, of that contributor, mm. particularly when they can start copying sentences from these texts into their own vocabulary notebooks and so on. They might have had diff the same experiences as us. It's sort of a copy and paste of these sentences. I think these experiences into their own language word tables or language notebooks or whatever language learning strategy they've got. Oh, I mean, yeah, that, that's uh, the principle. And it's rather, it's a difficult thing to do, but bridging the gap between written and spoken English, that's what I've tried to do with Comified, mm. with the texts that are included in Comified. No easy yeah. task, but I've had a, a good stab at it. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the big gaps, I think, in um, uh, resources and even activities that students can do kind of on their own outside of class um, are kind of beginner to intermediate listening comprehension activities and also fluency activity. Obviously, fluency, most of the time, the only thing you can really do is speak with people to improve your fluency. There are, there's one or two other things I can think of that you can do without actually speaking to someone, but they're, 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 they're a bit odd and they're few and far between. And then the other one is comprehension. You know, you get lots of pre-intermediate, intermediate students, and they'll say, well, how can I improve my listening comprehension? And obviously, they're nowhere near the level they need to be to, um, to watch uh, TV shows and stuff like that. You know, you can kind of, you can kind of uh, drill into sort of special interest YouTube stuff. And sometimes they can, they can kind of bridge the gap of their comprehension there because obviously they have a lot more context when it comes to a special interest that they might be interested in. But even then at, at sort of a pre-intermediate, intermediate level, it's very difficult really for them to understand it. So I feel like there is a need for something like that. Um, but then there are, there's always problems with, with uh, well, for one, it takes a lot of time and effort to, uh, as 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 you've as you've meant, kind of hinted at, it takes a lot a lot of time and effort to produce the material, ensure yeah. it's authentic, and then record the audio as well. That was something that um, uh, uh, Chris Lonsdale, who we interviewed interviewed recently, was telling us about. He's he's also got an application aimed at um, teaching um, English to Chinese speakers. Uh, that you can, it's, I think it's an app you can only actually get in China, isn't it, Neil? Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, localized. <laughs> yeah, but he was saying that the biggest challenge for him was literally just having people in a in a recording studio, like recording these the audio material. He said it just took like hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. Yeah, I I, yeah. I downloaded it, and you know, uh, I had a quick peek through there, and. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I agree. I agree with you, Rich, it's, and um, Steve. It's like it's kind of you have these the like the beginner level, and you know maybe something like Duolingo would would work to kind of bring you maybe up to an, an A two or something like that in a haphazard kind of way, and then after that, it's there's not so much aimed after you hit that plateau and then start moving into intermediate it's kind of like you're going from uh quantum physics to physics it's just they're, 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 they're separate things but where where does that bridge over and and i like i liked what you were doing and it reminded me a bit of i mean it's very rudimentary my thoughts with it but it reminded me a bit of um are you are you familiar with breaking news english where they have the text and they kind of try to kind of grade it and do activities with that. But yours is, version is obviously, well, not a version of it, but yours is better because it's, you know, a lot more personalized. Yes, I must have seen it a few years ago, Breaking English. I'm not too familiar with the ins and outs of it. But you, you touched upon now the intermediate plateau. Yeah. So that for me is my obsession. You know, we all need to earn a living, and I'm no different with his application, but trying to get these Polish learners of English to break out of that intermediate plateau, because I think the vast majority of them are at this level, mm -hmm. and they, don't, they haven't got the methods to get beyond that. It is rather 
a challenge of mine or an obsession of mine to to try to deal with that. So uh, what what's your approach with that? It's just kind of um, making these making these texts and uh, giving them more the uh, as you said focus being more focused on first person and them kind of taking it uh, and personalizing it to themselves because I, I noticed you know like with some of your blog posts you did put a lot of emphasis on like personalized sem- sentences and emphasizing phrases and stuff like that which I, I think is fantastic because we you know to to get students thinking like that is uh, I think a definite way to break break through that so they're not just too focused on the nitty gritty. I think that's it. Personalization. Yeah. Uh, I learned, I started learning Serbian seven years ago because of my wife and all right, fluency is a very loose word, but I think I was able to communicate in the language quite well after five months. Uh, I wasn't good at languages at school, but I, I began to realize the virtues of personalization. So it's easy to memorize a word and a collocation. But then I would create a personalized sentence with that word and collocation. Mm-hmm. And my teacher was a guide. She'd check those sentences. And, you know, these it was constantly reading these sentences of, sort of swimming in your brain. They're running around your mind constantly in conversation. And, and that for me is the essence of, of fluency, having this stock of personalized sentences uh, running around the mind. So uh, let's move from words. Anybody can memorize a word. Let's go to collocations, more difficult to memorize them. But now let's have the third step. Let's have those personalized sentences. And that's why we've got in Comified My Vocab. They can click on a a word or phrase of their choice, create a personalized sentence, and the moderator, me for now, can can check their sentences. Mm. Uh, And that's in in the price. You know, I haven't got the pricing structure right at the moment. Mm. It's it's all over the place, but Mm. that's what they get. As part of the package at the moment. And yeah, I that's uh, that. That sounds incredibly useful because I, I'm 100% with you on that. Uh, that's 100% my own approach to vocabulary: is uh, get away from individual words, move towards collocations and phrases, and um, probably uh, one of the best things you can do um, in terms of sort of encouraging the process of integrating that piece of vocabulary into your own into your own sort of active vocabulary, I think is, is personalization, uh, something that means something to you and sticks in your head. And then um, if that phrase or collocation has some flexibility to it, then that flexibility, I think, naturally wants you, once you just kind of become comfortable with the particular phrase that you've learned, you know, if it's, if it's present perfect or whatever, you know, the flexibility of using that becomes kind of obvious. You know, you can, you, you sort of are able to do that as a, as just a, a rational human, you know, once you become familiar with it, you can gain the flexibility later. I think when we sort of treat, teach the grammar first, it's kind of like we get the, get the cart before the horse to some extent. I think the grammarians would be out to hang me because I, <laughs> I learned, when I, when I learned Serbian, I, I picked up the third conditional after the third week of learning. <laughs> there doesn't have to be a fixed order you know i haven't yeah. got to go from i am to you know future perfect and mm. future tends to be a waste of time anyway but that's it anti-linear approach that's also i think mm. at the heart of coming fight yeah that's great and you know it it, it lends to that person's personality as well you know maybe that's kind of how they that's how they structure their thoughts so if that's how they you know they they what they lean on when they're just kind of thinking day to day then you know it makes sense for them to start to start with that and you know the more and more that we speak with people and with my experience i i do agree with uh personalization and it always pops up in like strange ways like um i this is not even anything to do with english language i remember reading an interview with peter sellers and to do his different accents he he had um and personalities he had set phrases of what he would use to be able to kind of like find the way to 
position his mouth to do certain accents and it reminds me of you know, teaching in China as uh, in Korea as well I think we mm. talked about this before Rich where we not not only were we thinking about personalizing sentences but also personalizing to cultures as well like I remember showing you know trying to encourage kids with oh well what do, what are they going to be sort of interested in oh we'll just use spider-man or you know like superman or or pepper pig or anything like that and pff, nothing but you know like when you start to kind of bring in uh doraemon and goku the stuff that they were more familiar with they were a little bit more excited because you know it's kind of what they've grown up with and I think the more that we just kind of personalize everything, uh, uh, it seems to, I don't know, make it more familiar uh, in a way. It, yeah. it, can't, it relaxes you. And I think that's quite important with, with learning as well. Yeah, I'd go along with that, with the familiarization, relaxation elements. I must say I've had a hard time of convincing my own students of the virtues of personalization. It's a work in progress. Mm. You know, some are into it, some are not. And, mm. uh, not everybody's the same, but uh, I can't base my beliefs on any real research. I do read the odd article now and then, but uh, frankly, I've had enough of the, the research I read in ELT. It's, it's just, mm. It seems to be regurgitate, reg regurgitating the same old things all the time. Yeah, isn't that funny? Um, I, 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 I know exactly what you mean with that. And... Um, you know, the, the, it, in fact, the more exciting and more kind of cutting edge sort of things going on in language uh, teaching, maybe in other areas as well, but this is our area, right, do tend to be kind of based more on people's anecdotal experiences, uh, which obviously <clears throat> is um, a bit of a faux pas for the academics. Um, but, you know, some of the really people who are doing really interesting things, uh, we spoke to uh, Jamie Keddy a couple of months back, you know, and, um, you know, his whole thing about um, dialogic storytelling and um, uh, like uh, narrative contextualization in the classroom. Like, you know, it's all just stuff that he's just been doing himself for years. Like it's not really being, you know, you could probably fish out some studies which kind of fit, you know, what he wants to <laughs> kind of use to justify his methodology. But really, it's just based on <clears throat> you know his experience as as a, as a human which is which is the whole point about this whole thing about storytelling right um so yeah and then when you look at the when you look at the kind of as you say the studies they do tend to regurgitate the same old the same old stuff i remember being so shocked about that actually at the start of the pandemic when um I, you know i i don't i don't go to a lot of like elt conferences or anything like that but i do kind of keep my nose in sometimes you know i've been to a handful and when the pandemic started they did all these online ones and i was like oh maybe it'd be actually be interesting to check out some of these now you know because let's see how how you know these institutions and teachers kind of you know start to innovate and talk about new different things they can do and my god they were just talking about exactly the same stuff and i just i couldn't believe it that you would have at the start of a pandemic, you would have an online conference and, you know, you'd be talk they'd be talking about stuff like, you know, um, uh, how to, how to engage, you know, pre-intermediate teens in the classroom or something. I was like, what, what's this got to do with the fact that we've had this massive change now in, in the way that we're working? Yeah. You know? This shift to technology just, and, you know, well, why, why aren't they doing more like what, what Steve's doing, you know? Hmm. I think we can say there are a lot of fence sitters out there and we've come to our old mate, Scott Formbury. Uh, mm. I, think, I think it's a typical ex example, really. It doesn't seem to be much based on logic anymore. I think the mm. reason I like reading books by uh, and articles by Hugh Deller, Andrew Walkley, lexical approach guys, is because it's just based on logic. Mm -hmm. I think my next blog post will be about uh, their book, Grammar Nonsense. You know, yeah. why, te why teach... Uh, reported speech, for example. Why does it have to be in the curriculum? Why don't we campaign to publishers to, to get it out of the curriculum? It reported speeches to the box. Report things like they show us in these books anyway, relative clauses and so on. So there's a lot we can delete from this uh, grammatical syllabus. 
Yeah, mm. I mean, it's almost like a lot of these syllabi that they're just there to teach little points that we could all tick off and then both the teacher and the student can agree and the institution can agree that we've covered all these points therefore you now have english at an intermediate level and you know we all know that that's it just doesn't work that way and so why it with doing stuff like you're doing steve and you know a lot of the other people that we talk to it feels like there's a lot of shackles being removed and we're kind of starting to move to more back to the basics uh, of just focusing on well how do we communicate how do we communicate and how does english facilitate that what do we need to focus on you know to actually be able to communicate through english and what's the best way of going about that that we uh, just, forget about the rules for a second Let, let's just go into that you know and it, 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 I, th I find it quite exciting and I find a lot of people like yourself Steve that are, are out there doing these really cool and interesting things and yeah, I think that it's kind of it feels like the beginning of when uh, community language was around in the early 70s and they had all these kind of suggestopedia and the silent way and you know a lot of those kind of mm -hmm. went out of fashion but it started this whole new boom. And I feel like we're in that little point now where we kind of, there's this germination of some new way or mm. or just even a more honest way of saying, well, this, just just learn English in, in a, as a means to communicate rather than, you know, being caught in all the, the rules or mechanisms of institutions. You know, I'd go along with that, back to basics. I think, uh, I've not read it in any great detail, but the Longman grammar of spoken and written English, look at the most common lexical verbs in communication, say, get. How many collocations, how many multi-word phrases, multi-word items do we have with the word get? I mean, yeah. this should be on the syllabus. Uh, what about the schwa sound? Pronunciation teachers are obsessed with a schwa sound with the uh, but we forget to realise, or they forget to realise that it's actually an element of fluency, you know, linking these prepositions and uh, and contents a piece of cake. You know, it's just make, it makes speaking a lot faster. So that's back to basics for me, schwa, mm. collocations, uh, lexical verbs. Yeah, getting into mm. corpus and corpora, not in too much detail, but looking at general trends. What are the most common lexical verbs in, in conversation? But that's, uh, these, these items are the essence of fluency for me. Mm. I think a connected speech as well, that might be going a bit too far for learners stuck at the intermediate level, but who knows, maybe it's worth giving it a go with TED Talks, for example, e examining connected speech. That's the mm. big, biggest reason, I think, why people can't understand native speakers who are yeah yeah, yeah uh, that's huge that is really huge and i know you have a lot of thoughts on this rich yeah oh. millions yeah but the the thing is i mean i kind of fly all over the place with the with the way that i i teach things like connected speech um although in general i would say that my um approach has drifted away from actually um you know the kind of thing where you might um have some examples and get some uh you know some inductive teaching where the, the student sort of works out that there's these linking sounds and then goes through and marks them or whatever and gone, gone kind of away from that and gone kind of more towards just generally um teaching pronounce teaching pronunciation and pronunciation drilling in a different way uh which a way that gets a bit more engagement and a bit of a higher level of, of focus to kind of notice the general differences in how, you know, uh, someone, a, a native speaker or whatever sounds compared to how you sound as a, as a student and really paying attention to that. Uh, and I, I feel it. the process is similar to um, uh, learning a musical instrument and, um, or even learning to sing uh, where 
uh, most people who learn a musical instrument, when they're learning to play a song that they want to learn to play, um, depends if you're classically trained or not. I, I just learned guitar myself. So when I'm kind of learning a, a part of the song over and over again and kind of work out exactly what they're doing, guitar and you know as you kind of train your ear more and more you hear more kind of subtleties and you also you know you begin to get this image in your head of already what of how certain bits of a song are being played you know uh, and i very much feel that um that, that learning pronunciation and language can be a similar process um and that's the, that's the direction i kind of go with uh, connected speech and certainly the, 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 the intentional or the deliberate part of it is in kind of helping students to unlink the written English from, um, from what they're going to hear because it's, it's really very different. It get, written English gives you a bit of a guide, but if you come from a language like Spanish where it's almost entirely phonemic, it's not 100% phonemic, there are some tricks in there but but it's it's primarily it's 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 pretty damn phonemic and um <clears throat> one of the big things for them is really just detaching uh the letters that they're seeing from the sounds that they've relied on for 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 their entire life in their own language basically um and then after they've done that after you get away from that uh then it's 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 almost like this reprogramming of sound which is very much an ear training process and then a kind of physical mouth training process things like that and just kind of rant <laughs> <laughs> general idea yeah yes yeah beyond me i haven't gone into much detail as a pronunciation teacher but mm. i think yes trying to represent a native speaker that's what i've tried to do comify mm. with these texts and the native speaker mm. contributors really i've told them use contractions you know i know they're reading from scripts with their texts mm. the contributors but use contractions, use connected speech, don't slow down deliberately. I've tried to, to keep things as natural as possible. Mm. Use schwa as well, yeah, with these uh, prepositions. No, I, I think that's it's very important with, um, with the connected speech. And I think that it's one of those, I think if you were to put like key points of moving beyond that plateau, uh, beyond the plateau and getting firmly into being intermediate and going more advanced, that realization that the, the words on, on just aren't separated, but it's almost like, well, we are chunking them and putting them in phrases and almost treating them as one thing is a, a huge realization. So yeah, definitely. If you if you made that a part of Comified, then you know it's it's going to help a lot. Especially if you can kind of get them to have that realization that it's like, oh, what am I doing? Rather than speaking like a robot, I'm speaking, I guess, in these these phrases. Mm. That's one of the things I kind of liked actually about the app when I was playing around with it is um, how uh, you have the text and. Um, there's like phrases highlighted within the text and kind of then a breakdown of how the, how that phrase might be used. And uh, just that as something which takes the emphasis away from individual words and more to phrases, I think was, was kind of nice to see because the vast majority of English learning material out there, uh, you know, when, it, when you have a text, you kind of get words from the text, don't you? There'll be some activity and there'll be, like words, you know, and yeah, okay, words, sometimes, sometimes you have to learn words. I mean, you know, you couldn't really learn a pen any other way than, than just learning the, just the word pen. I suppose you could, you, you know, you could say, you know, I need a pen or something like that, but uh, that might not be the most useful thing to do. But then a lot of other, a lot of other parts of language are, for, in fact, the vast majority of them, from, from what I can tell, especially when it comes to speaking fluently, um, are, are very phrasal and they even, they even seem to be supplied to us by our brain in a phrasal manner, right? It's like, it's not like our brain kind of supplies individual words to us and then kind of uses some grammar to put them together. They just come as phrases, um, which is why you often get, I think, natives kind of, you know, just butchering the rules of grammar because they're, you know, they're just, they're using pieces of language and stringing it together and your, your mind isn't fast enough to, to do whatever grammar adjustment will fit. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, that, that was one of the things that I liked, which I noticed you've got some analysis on that. And even there was even specifically kind of feedback on that, Steve. Is that something that you found to be popular? Um, I mean, the language I, transfer I, part for, for Polish speakers or? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I haven't gained much feedback so far on steps three and four for each language transfer part. I need to look into that. My feeling is there might be a bit too much detail there. Maybe right, okay. I might need to start focusing on the phrases personalization and start cutting out some of the longer explanations. Mm. So it might be as if they're reading a book, but it's still early, too early to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. one of the great things with... Uh, these apps um, is you can kind of evolve them as you go along, right? Um, the the phrases. So I'm interested. Do you have like a, a set number in mind for, of phrases to you know that a student needs to kind of I guess acquire to fully grasp? Uh, I don't know, like a certain section of English. You know, just say the past, whatever. Uh, if they're trying to learn the past, is there a certain uh, amount of phrases uh, that they that you found works? Uh, how how have you kind of found that the the phrase the personalized phrases work? You know, like the amounts or you know it, how long the sentence is. Does it have to be a certain amount of words? I'm just wondering, kind of like the logistics. So anyway, it's entirely random, but sometimes some of my texts might be over 400 words long and there might be 25 phrases that I want them to learn. Mm -hmm. But it's just purely incidental learning, none of these particular tense. Mm -hmm. Get them to create their personalized sentences. I think it's a good idea to perhaps emphasize present perfect, past simple, present perfect, continuous, present simple. Those are the big four. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I'm not really interested in any of the tenses or aspects, if you want to call them that, because we don't really use them. Yeah. So if, I'd rather drive that point home for the key four aspects. And you think about, for example, the future continuous, future perfect, when when was the last time you guys used those? It'd be tough to remember. So that's it's it. It's purely incidental. Teaching English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In real life, yeah, we've yeah. I'll probably never used them, but... I love it. I just, I just imagine Steve just going into his app or into a student's brain, and they, you know, they've got all that English kind of jumbled together, and he's going, "Yeah, don't need this, don't need that. Get rid of this. You know, it's, you're, it's holding down the plane. We want to take off, so like, get rid of the, all the seats. We just need these, these things." I, I really like it. It's, it's, it's really refreshing. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. In terms of personalizing, I don't know how fast some of the learners will go. I mean, I. I've got an admin panel. Not many of the users have created these sentences yet, but uh, maybe they'll get into it. Maybe I need a bit blog or a website about personalization. I don't know. Um, that's a big challenge for me at the moment, getting them to make use of these strategies. Yeah, um, I mean, that that's that's always the case, right? When, when you're teaching, you can... Uh, and I know Rich has been experiencing this lately with his YouTube channel. You can put out and give the, the give students the greatest strategies, but did they listen? No, well, no, they, well, they want, well, they want well, 10 the ways that, to the, say, the, yeah. open the door without yeah. okay, embarrassing so that, yourself in seven yeah. easy minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, well, is that what they want e even then? Um, so I, don't know I think that, I think that the people who are keyed into you, uh, they they will listen you know i mean any teacher who's had a student for like you know years um they're gonna they're, they'll take they'll take everything on board that you say because they are well and truly convinced <laughs> that that you know maybe too much <laughs> that, you're, that you're the sort of uh, the person who can tell them what 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 what's what but um yeah when it comes to a general audience uh we come to this kind of standard problem of um or this 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 juxtaposition of what what students think they want and what teachers think they want, and uh, and I don't think that there's necessarily I don't think I, I I wouldn't want to say that it should be the extreme way either way, because there's sort of there is a 
teachers do have a, or at least should have knowledge and perspective to be able to guide someone's learning in a way that they wouldn't on their own. It's like going back to my guitar, like uh, if I just learned, when I learned to play guitar on my own, I did have a lot of problems with like tension and it was very difficult for me to work out what the problem was there, you know? Um, and luckily I've got some friends who play guitar very well and they were able to show me, oh, you know, you're holding your shoulder up here and you're doing this. And, and without having them, it could have been very difficult for me to realize that that's what I needed to focus on, that, you know, I needed to kind of sort out my posture while I was playing and relax a little bit more in certain ways. So, you know, there is a need for that. And, 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 you know, I might not have necessarily agreed that that should have been my focus until someone who had a bit more expertise pointed out to me. But on the other hand, we've got this idea, you know, where the teachers are just like, you know, oh, this is what we need to do now. And it's kind of like, you can't take it all away from the student. There needs to be some guidance from them. So there's definitely a balance. Um, so middle. But going back to the YouTube thing, uh, yeah, I mean, the, it, it was very, very difficult to find an audience that got a YouTube thousand subscribers. And it used to be very, very popular, like over 10 years ago, like when I first set it up. I used to get, you know, videos would blow up back then because there wasn't a lot of sort of competition. It wasn't saturated. Uh, whereas these days when I make a video and I think the, the quality of the videos is way better than what it was back then. It's well more informed. You know, I've been teaching for a long time so I can give some people sort of my idea of what would be top tips, you know, things that if I was doing them in a lesson, I'd consider them to be sort of premium tuition, you know, in a way, um, things that I would expect people to pay good money for. Uh, and I'm giving it away for free in these, in these videos. One was there was very on even videos, which I considered to contain some really, you know, really useful information for students. And on the other hand, you'll get one of, you know, a big YouTube channel like English 101 or English with Lucy or whatever. And they'll pop out a video which says, you know, uh, here's uh, 10 ways of saying uh, I'm sorry without saying I'm sorry. And they'll get like, you know, 5 million views. <laughs> it's like, and all they do is say, and here's another way you can say I'm sorry, right? It's, uh, you know, and they kind of give these synthetic drills as well. I really do apologize for that. You know, it's like they're acting on, on stage in GCSE, a GCSE level performance or something. You know, there's not, it's not, it's not natural English, in my opinion. Uh, not that I want to criticize them too much. All power to them. They're incredibly successful on YouTube and they're doing very well with it. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the, the audience is clearly there for that. The students really want it. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the best thing for them. But, you know, anyway. Yeah, English with Lucy, I'll have to check her out. Uh, I think that she's pretty much the the the, the most popular uh, kind of uh, tuba teacher for English. I think she's got about six million subscribers or something. Right, check her out then. Uh, yeah, circling back to the app, uh, I think a, a big issue here is uh, lack of contact with the language. I think some of my best converts are people who I have classes with every second or third day, even if it's for 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, in fact, most of my classes are not according to fixed lesson lengths. You know, students pay for a fixed number of minutes and a, a lesson lasts how long it lasts. So yeah, I think that's yeah, the yeah. same thing with COVID fire. It's just, it can be 15 minutes a day. The most important thing is they have contact with that language. And again, it's about, about logic. My best student from Łódź, the city of Łódź in Poland, and I can say he's the best because he's the most committed and probably got the best level. Uh, he's got, he has contact with English every day, even if, if it's for 15, 20 minutes, even if our classes last 20 minutes mm -hmm. or 17 minutes or 18 minutes. Um, that's the thing here. So Comified is very much a, an everyday app. You know, they can do a text a day. They can do a few others second day. Uh, and that's what I'm working to at the moment, the, the principle I'm working to. Yeah, because everyone's different um i mean that was one of the principles of stuff like tiktok was you could you can use it for just 
you know, 10 seconds or you can use it for a minute or five minutes. It scales in different ways in order to keep people engaged. So I think that's probably a, a, a good approach, especially with English and, you know, to be able to adapt to, you know, the learner as well. It's uh, it's what a relatively new thing uh to be able to have like learning a learning app where you can engage in that way before if you wanted to learn english you had that set amount of time that you had to go out of your way to get so i think that's one of these interesting revolutions that we've got with the technology and i'm wondering how that is going to impact the learner i think it's only going to really benefit them because they can get their english <laughs> sorry it's a terrible way of saying it but get their english just whenever they want so it's almost like a you know previously we would be worried back in the day of where your next meal is going to come from and now it was previously you'd get worried where your next piece of english learning is going to come from but now it's readily accessible so I, i'm wondering what's going to come from that i mean what how do you think things are going to progress i mean you've got a bit of an inside track with with the app and uh you're in this ed tech area how do you kind of see it evolving uh, and moving for both the teacher and the learner do you have any thoughts on that uh not too many i must admit but probably i did uh when i was preparing a, a pitch deck for investors probably i did get some figures that it's only set to c continue this trend mm -hmm. billions of pounds that are going to be poured into to ed tech over the next 10 years astonishing numbers really but uh trying to picture a teacher using a mobile phone in a classroom or an app with students yeah you know, i guess it is possible in language schools it's possibly happening now i don't know i've not worked in language school for for many a year but probably it's the only way forward it will be the way forward mm -hmm. yeah. my my most recent experience um which was uh british council hanoi in um i left there in about uh was it 20 late 2018 somewhere around then anyway um and um <clears throat> so they did have they did i mean that's obviously the british council they got loads of money uh so they did have plenty of technology available um uh you know uh, specifically tablets they had lots of tablets and um and the number one thing that they were used for i mean it's the thing with technology even now after all this time it's still sort of underutilized um and, you know, even as someone who's a massive technophile, like, you know, I love technology. Uh, I've got a half-built PC just on my workbench just over there. You know, I love tinkering around with electronics. I love, uh, I love messing around with software. You know, I'm, I'm really a techie person. Um, but even, you know, I, I'm not as experimental as I should be when it comes to sort of <clears throat> teaching technology. And um, the thing that, those tablets were maybe 95 at the time kahoot <laughs> so it's just you put a big do you know what kahoot is steve you come across that uh, you can tell me about it uh so kahoot's ba it's basically just a quiz right so you write a little quiz uh like maybe 10 to 20 questions and you have a b c d answers and the questions will pop up on the projector or the whiteboard or whatever and then everyone's connects to like a code and they just answer your d so it's just like a little quiz game um uh, you know it'll tend to last five or ten minutes um normally teachers will just use it like at the end of the at the end of the class to if, like a filler for five or ten minutes uh, the kids absolutely love it. Uh, well, the adults, everybody loves it, basically. Uh, but it's very, very simple, you know, and it very much is a thing, but it's a huge underutilization of that, of, of technology, really. You know, it's just like, just using it for that one thing. But really, like 95% of the time when teachers were like walking downstairs with, the, you know, uh, with, with uh, six iPads, 
in their hands, it'll be because they're going to do 10 minutes of cahoots at the end of the class, you know. Um, have some other stuff which would tend to be at the other end of the spectrum if you saw the kahoot stuff as being kind of very controlled and very much you know it was very very much a controlled reflection right it's just a you know students in teams a b c or d you could you could just be using mini whiteboards really couldn't you i mean it's not yeah. like you need that that um that technology for that very controlled but then the other thing that they were often used for the tablets where it was like the other end of the spectrum, perhaps too far at the other end of the spectrum, which would be like very open research. So it would be like if you're doing some project based work and, you know, you're just you people are kind of working your students were working in teams with something and you just kind of say, like, use the Internet to like prepare something. So that's like the other end of it where it's so open that most of the time people don't really know what they're doing. Right. They kind of it's almost like. Um, sometimes students, you know, this is kind of going a little bit against the Sugata, Sugata Mitra thing of the, the, the kids with the iPad. I don't know if you, if you've come across that bit of research, Steve, uh, but anyway, um, it's kind of the idea that, um, you know, if you just give some kids an iPad, they'll sort of learn how to use it on their own. I think there's some truth to that, but I also think students do work well with some because if you just kind of say to someone, it's kind of like if you if you if you get a bunch of people together and you say, have a conversation, like he knows what to talk about. But if you say, have a conversation about the problems with the environment at the moment, then people have got some ideas, you know. So it's like they can kind of be more creative. And I felt like very much with the use of the tablets, that middle ground was not used. go on the internet and do whatever you want and prepare something or do this quiz game at the end of class a b c d yeah there's a danger it might go too far i would never envisage or i'd never like covid to replace teaching or traditional teaching for 15 20 minutes mm. to get into these texts and, and personalization mm. and so on yeah that would, that would be ideal if there's a 60 minute class let's have 10 minutes yeah. of an application doesn't have to be comified it can be anyone 10 15 minutes that would be a ideal scenario yeah. um but anyway i just wanted to comment really on the, the getting comified off the ground the, the interesting part for me was dealing with these answers the uh, mobile app developers and companies which developed mobile. i had some wicked quotations from six euros to three hundred thousand euros Whoa. to get this app developed changing topic a bit here but for me this is the biggest learning curve just i think a company that quoted three hundred thousand euros is located in poznan probably city of poznan uh going with the idea should i get any stuff or do it by myself unfortunately in the end I found a developer, a Flutter developer, Flutter is a coding program, cross mobile, iOS and Android, who would do it for a very reasonable fee, which I could fund myself. So for me, that was a, a great thing. I didn't have to get the investors involved. But for me, it's been a, such a learning curve, not just in terms of linguistics, but in terms of uh, business and looking after myself, trying to fend mm. for myself uh, along. Mm. Even when I did sketches of Comified in my notebook. I, I got them developed into high fidelity wireframes. And even this guy tried to rip me off. He quoted me about 120 hours of work. And I, I met with him one day in a shopping center. We did a bit of brainstorming based on my assessment. It probably would have taken him 10 hours. So it's, it's really been a, an interesting journey. Mm. Uh, and probably, probably believe too much in the methodology. And I've, I've not acquired enough beta users, testers for the app. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think things are moving in the right direction now. I've got a few more beta users. They're telling me what's what. Um, but actually, the mobile developer has been very helpful. He's told me uh, perhaps some of the, the tactics and features that I, I didn't need at the beginning. I wanted to include, for example, space repetition. But it's probably not necessary for an MVP, a minimum viable product. 
Uh, mm. I wanted to include Comi Chat, a forum to discuss the text with other users, with teachers and moderators, but probably not necessarily at the beginning. So yeah, well, it's decision making process really, and yeah, getting involved with these freelancers and mobile app developers has been truly fascinating. Mm. And yeah, I've made mistakes along the way. It's good for me. I'll, I'll learn from this. No, I yeah, I think I think you have to be really careful with uh, feature creep uh, when it comes to these kinds of projects. Uh, because you know there's 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 loads of stuff out there which sort of does everything, and um, you know it can be it can be kind of off putting when you come to see a new thing, and you're just presented with a kind of less professionally put together sort of thing that does everything. You know, uh, like the amount of times that people have tried to reinvent Moodle, right? So Moodle is a very popular e-learning platform. It's very flexible. You know, it has a, it has a forum. You can upload videos. You can use it for all kinds of stuff. You know, it's probably the most popular sort of um, platform uh, in the world for e-learning. And there are so many products which basically just do another Moodle. Uh, you know, so and when you see that, it's kind of like, well, what's this thing doing that's different? We've already got Moodle. Moodle's kind of very solid anyway, you know, and what's it trying to do? So I think it's really important, actually, to kind of really filter your customer base into what your strength is. So it's and using your thing, oh, this is what this thing does. And then if you have, if you want to add your community-based elements and extras and whatnot, once you kind of got off the ground, well, that's going to be easy then, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. interesting. It sounds like you've having, you, you went through the process with developing your language system methodology of stripping down English and throwing away the stuff that's, you know, maybe you don't need to kind of move uh, further up the chain. Um, and you then you're having to do the set again the same process when you're doing the app with you thinking well what is it that the, are the the core things that i need to include within this and you know get rid of the the forums and stuff yeah exactly yeah i wanted to include too much at the beginning but the main thing for me actually is a, is a personalization and that's in there um but looking at it from the perspective of a user I guess it's a speaking element. That would be the ideal situation, linking them up with teachers to speak about these texts. That's that's the ideal vision for me. Probably something like iTalky, getting a, a set of teachers involved, maybe teachers who want to advertise their own services on the app. Yeah. As well, and they can get in, involved with the text and have the, the bundle of text for free and, and get involved with that. The, various options but that would be the ideal situation it's lacking the the speaking element at the moment conversation with a a native or any teacher a good non-native speaker that's what it's one of the one of the biggest difficulties isn't it it seems with these these apps is you know you can do all you can do drills they can learn the lexi they can learn all these different parts of grammar uh even you know, doing phrases uh, and such. Um, but when it comes to that speaking, that seems to be the thing that's what's lacking in real life. I know Duolingo and uh, some of the Chinese apps that I've, I've used, you, um, you, do a, you do speaking and then they have a program, uh, might be an AI or some program where it listens to you and then kind of like, you know, uh, puts your sound file on top of a, a native speaker sound file and see, and then it kind of gives you a rating or something like that. I've seen that and they, you know, there might be some, something to that in the future. Uh, but then there's on the, the flip side, there's more kind of like what you were talking about. And it's actually what, um, Chris Lonsdale uses with his, uh, language app. He has, um, he calls them language parents, where they the person goes through the course, but then at certain key points, they do have conversations with 
whoever their language parent is and that language parent kind of looks back on you know the uh the activities that that person has done and then they can kind of like have conversations with that but i think one of the things with the apps it seems like there's with the ed tech industry that aren't teachers they just want to kind of put out an app there where it's just set it and go you know so you just uh oh you're just doing exercises and they don't they it doesn't need to employ any more people because that's going to be a a cost i would imagine but if you to go ahead uh, with your idea of having uh something where you can have these teachers do that personalized uh dialogue or what have you but also they can advertise on your platform uh, that, that would be a, an interesting way to integrate and also resolve that problem indeed yeah i don't know what the future holds uh, at the moment it's rather about gaining users mm -hmm. not really too much interested in selling the app or selling the bundles of tech it's just getting users uh, and i'm trying to do it really without putting a, a lot of money into marketing so i've been working on my website recently it, it gets quite mm. a few visitors on a monthly basis mm. how many of them will see the comified ad on the home page in my world mm. start it's an, a <clears throat> marketing element again is another learning curve for me it will be yeah. a learning curve yeah, I think we can sympathise with you there, Steve. We've got some, uh, <laughs> we've done a, well, yeah, we've done a few things with uh, online marketing. Uh, I, I've Rich spent is breaking of, pencils underneath the table. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've spent a bit of money on online marketing for my YouTube channel, and um, very much what I found is um, bring if you pay money, it'll bring in clicks. That's for sure. And it can even it can bring in participants even. So um, I was doing uh, online less online streamed lessons on YouTube, uh, and the the thing is, I, I actually do online stream lessons on a very popular service, uh, someone else's business, right? So this is me kind of working for them as an employee, and um, you know we get hundreds of live students coming in, and it's brilliant. So I kind of thought, well, I've, I, could, I could do exactly the same thing on my own channel, right? Uh, so I started doing that on my own channel and, you know, couldn't get any traction at all. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do some advertising. And um, it worked, as in it got people in the classroom. So, you know, I do like an online stream and, um, you know, it, people were showing up from these ads and they were interacting with the class, you know, so they were real real people, you know, interacting with the class, uh, participating, kind of seem, seemingly enjoying it, right? So I kind of thought, oh, this is good. Uh, and then next week, same time, same class, didn't do the advertising. So uh, <laughs> I kind of, yeah, I've, I've, I'm kind of thinking, I, I know there is some value to paying for online marketing, but I very much feel like it's not the right way of going about things. I feel like if you've got the product and it's working well, the marketing really I think is this sort of simple part. You know, if everything else is in place, uh, I feel like the marketing can come after that. I think focusing on marketing first, you start to get into like a horrible way of doing things. You know, it's kind of like uh, it's that whole thing about in, like emotional investment and, you know, getting people hooked in and building up email lists and all this kind of stuff. And, I don't know. I don't really want to be, I don't know about you, Steve, but I don't really want to be an online marketer. You know, I want to, I want to be something else. And marketing is just a part of that, of that skill set. So that was my personal experience with it anyway. Yes. Tough to say it might be my downfall. Uh, Instagram. I haven't got an Instagram account. I, I rarely use Twitter and so on. So I've, mm. I've always been rather, rather against with that, but I know I need to, to get into it a bit more in order yeah. to, to move this forward. Mm. Well, the, the thing that the marketing I was specifically using was the Facebook advertising because you can be so targeted, you know, you can actually target people who have certain likes, certain interests. So, you know, people who want to learn English, whose nationality is Polish, for example. Right. Uh, and things like that. Uh, this age range, you know, this geography, you can be very, very targeted about your audience, which theoretically should be very helpful. But it's also, I think the, 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 the cost per 
click is just enough that you know it's 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 tight so for you to then make that into something uh you know commercially viable i think everything else in place uh in my opinion what do you think about approaching these influences a question to both of you major influences and uh, minor ones if we were to call them that i yeah. i th i think uh, it's a decent approach um i know a lot of a lot of people that do that nowadays um we, we for example we have a, a company in vancouver called vessi um they make these waterproof shoes trainers however you want to call them uh they're fantastic and they don't particularly advertise they um they will have influencers you know uh just wear their products use their products uh they they will have some popular videos that they will sponsor and and stuff and i think it's uh it's probably going to be the way moving forward because it's really about where the eyes are and in the past we could always say yeah everyone's going to be watching friends on channel four at blah 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 time so you know we want to put that advertisement there but nowadays mm, i i don't think that applies so much anymore i think it's more who are you following um what are you watching on TikTok, and you know actually participating you know doing these sorts of uh, interviews uh, or you know having someone you know use your use your app and see how they deal with it i think is is a better way moving forward and i think it, it will work i don't i'm not sure it will be as fast as paying for clicks on google or facebook because that's what they want you to do uh so mm. that's going to get you the the fastest results because you're working within their system um but if you are engaging with other people's communities that you know are you know the community or similar to community that you are wanting to build i think that will that will really work and I, mm. for us i mean that's what we're trying to do we're tr you know we, we try to build a community we try to engage with uh, other teachers and other learners and you know we're mm. still we're we're stumbling and uh trying to maneuver our way through this new this new yeah. world and trying to figure out also who who are who are watching us as well because we found that you know we we do have teachers watch our shows but also we have learners that are are, are interested in uh learning english but also want to know you know well how does how does that go along what do other think, teachers think of other teachers so it's, yeah i think i think one of the things we found the audience on youtube is that there's just uh there's 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 a great deal of teachers watching youtube compared to students so we attract a lot of students don't we actually even though we haven't tried you know I, I it's not like i don't we don't really do anything especially if anything we make our, our effort goes into attracting teach students just seem to show up and i guess that's the extent that when a non-native finds our channel uh they're like oh this is kind of interesting it's some english teachers speaking about and going into things it kind of gives them a behind the fourth wall um uh, perspective doesn't it but I, I just wanted to comment actually steve just give my opinion on the whole influencer thing mm -hmm. i think i'm a bit more cynical than neil is uh about that whole thing um i i have a bit of a background in games journalism so you know i have a, i've had a bit of an exposure to that sort of world and i think i i personally I don't even like the term influencer and it really really rubs me up the wrong way that people actually refer to themselves as influencers now and it's kind of like that's oh, a really like that. weird yeah it's really it seems to me like a really odd sort of um i don't know if you've noticed on linkedin you can kind of change your profile to be like an influencer and rather than connect it changes the button to follow 
you know, and I've seen a few people like that on LinkedIn. I'm like, I don't want to follow, you know, I'll connect with you, but follow, like, what is this? Like, you know, it's just, it, it sets up this kind of peculiar hierarchy and it's based on audience trust. So it's like, oh, my audience, you know, so I'm, I can influence them. So personally, my perspective on that would be, uh, if I if I was if I was let's say of someone being called an influencer, um, and I could have I had people who I could influence, I think I would I would personally uh, if there was some sort of financial agreement. First of all, uh, I think it would be complete disclosure with the audience, as in to say I've been paid to look at this, um, just so you know, and then. I would need there to not be any clause which would say, for example, I can't be negative about it. Now, I don't know if realistically that's how it works with influencers. In fact, I know for a fact that there's not a there are regulations when it comes to that. And there's been, there have been plenty of scams. People have just done like a, a, a slush a slush video about something and then it comes out later that they were paid a bunch of money by the company, didn't disclose it, you know, and it had to be a slush piece and all the rest of it. And, you know, I, I personally think it's a bit of a shame that, that kind of thing goes on. Um, and I think likewise, uh, Neil, if we were to, to be sort of paying someone to, to promote our stuff, I think I'd want them to be the kind of person who actually says, you know, I'll take and I'll look at your stuff and I'll do a video on it, but I'm going to disclose that. And that's kind of where our relationship financially ends. So there's no guarantee that I'm going to look at your stuff and say, oh, this is brilliant. You know, um, I will give my honest opinion, you know. Um, now, ultimately, maybe it's down to the audience of those. Mm -hmm. They are. You, um, I would hope you know, any audience that I had, I'd want them to kind of have faith that I'm giving them the real deal and that that's something that they value, you know, not that uh, or whatever. But clearly there's plenty of people out there who, you know, aren't as bothered about that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's all an interesting game. I need to find the right ones if we're to call them influencers, whatever you want to call them, I don't know. I think so I some of the, I mean, yes, I mean, you could, you could just call them sort of social media personalities or something like that. But as I've said, there's a, there's, there are a great number of people who actually refer to themselves as influencers, people who even, uh, I've had contact with people who went off their, uh, e Gmail with it. And these, these are tuba teachers specifically who I'm talking about, uh, you know, like online teachers doing videos and getting loads of students involved and stuff. And then when I like uh you know online influencer <laughs> it's like oh my god okay it's like they're almost asking me to pay them money for their sort of time and an influence or something i don't know anyway. yes and i'm so far detached from that i think for me the journey is very interesting actually influencing or cooperating with these influencers and the journey to getting this app out there was also interesting for me actually I, I remember when the app came out that the app, you know, that, mm. that was the interesting thing for me. Okay, the journey is back on now, trying to find some tactics to, to get through to these influencers and, and mm. to market the app somewhat. But uh, that was the most interesting thing for me. Yeah. You know, we all need to earn a living, and I, I'm not hiding that fact. But yeah, yeah. Actually, getting to that point the day the app came out, that was a. Uh, fascinating part for me i mean there is there is no doubt that if you got someone like english with lucy or um the girl from english 101 is also big you know the video on your thousands of new subscribers there's no doubt about it um but then it's kind of that's that's the question isn't it is like uh, I think it's very unlikely that they do something like that for free. And well, they've got their own really... products as well, and that would be uh, that would be in conflict. Um, well, it depends. Possibly. I think I think English One will have a competing product, but I don't. I don't think English with Lucy actually has a product. She does. She's she, she, she... like a journaling thing. I think is that actually hers though, or like a sponsorship? I'm not sure. Maybe you're right. Yeah. 
Um, but uh, but the other thing is my expert, my knowledge of hearing inf influencers, of hearing social media personalities talk about this. Again, this was from video games journalism. So I used to watch a lot of video game podcasts online in the early days of YouTube, you know, and these were very, very big people who were kind of up and coming. It was all new. And uh, they used to talk about it. And they said they got loads of these emails all the time. So they all the time they'd be getting emails from companies saying, hey, could you look at our product? Here's, you know, we'll pay you whatever amount of money. Uh, and they said the vast majority of them, they just ignored completely. <laughs> so I guess I guess that's where your suggestion earlier, Steve, comes in of, of where you might want to have a look at some kind of uh, slightly lesser known uh, social media people, right? Rather than the big one, because the big ones are going to get loads and loads and loads of these emails. And they're probably, if, if, they're, if they are going to take some money to go into your product, it's probably going to be quite a large amount. Whereas the smaller ones, they've still got, they've got a very loyal audience. Like I said, I mean, uh, you know, I would, I think audiences really do trust. This is probably where the term influencer comes from. They really do trust the people. I know the people on my channel, Professor Rich, like they, they're, they're people who are still around. They really trust what I'm saying, you know, and it took a lot of effort to build up that trust. And, and I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, there's there's a great deal of value in that. But then maybe what you'll find is that the the kind of smaller channels are the ones that are less likely to make any guarantees about whether they'll uh, whether they'll be positive or not <laughs> about the product itself. Mm. Indeed, Richard. I think I'll learn. I think I approached uh, the most famous social media personality and a few months ago. And of course, she ignored me. Mm. Yeah. I know what to expect now. You know, I've got a target. The right influencers, I think, and people yeah. with uh, seven hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube or one point five million, this, as this lady has got, I think, yeah, it's not the way forward right now. Yeah, well, another another thing to look at, Steve, is if 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 uh, she's got a like a, a media person or an agent or something, and I know it seems a bit weird dealing with these third parties, but um, most of the time, uh, PR will respond, and if they measure that it's valuable. Uh, they will get in touch with them. Um, so that's this comes from my experience of uh, um, writing interviews uh, with video games developers. And, um, you know, it was kind of nice if you could get direct contact with a video games developer, but a lot of the time that wasn't particularly possible. But I did find a lot of utility in the in the PR context. And, um, you know, if they, they, they would at the very least respond and let you know kind of whether they were interested, whether they weren't and, and what, you know, I mean, that's their job. Their job is to find what's worth the client's time, right? Their age. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll at least tell you, for example, oh, you know, you, you're going to need to pay a bit more or, you know, whatever your, your app needs to be bigger before they're going to take a look at this or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key the key points is just getting yourself out there and be very clear in what you deliver and what you feel like you can uh, do to you know help your students because you know your students are also going to be your clients as well. So you know I think it would be good to kind of circle back a little bit uh, as to you know like the what what you focus on with the app. And, you know, from from me, what it sounds like, it sounds like you have a couple of core points on the app to help students move from beginner to intermediate to, to break through that plateau. Uh, it seems to be that you have um, one, a focus on Lexian, stripping it down to really having, I guess, core uh, words or, you know, Lexi sets to focus on also um, doing connected speech really focusing on, on that along with those uh, the Lexi and also personalization with with the phrases and getting students to kind of own the, the language that they're learning uh, those seem to be the the three the, the three areas that i kind of came across when i when i had a, a play around with the app is there would you agree with that or uh, is there any more that you'd like to add i'll go along yeah. beginner to intermediate 
I think it's rather a little bit higher than that, helping them break out the intermediate plateau to become advanced. But oh, debatable okay. What, it's debatable what these words mean anyway. But some of the texts might be suitable for, some of them might be suitable for lower intermediate learners. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly no discrimination with, with the text. No, that's a, the intriguing thing. You don't know what's going to come next with the next text. So it depends who wrote the text as well, because some of the, the contributors, um, some are American and they're not very well educated. Some are British and highly educated. It depends how they write, how they prepare the text. So, yeah, that's the beauty of it. But in general, we we're focusing on the, the intermediate plateau. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of learners get stuck on that because of fossilization. Their errors have become fossilized. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to get rid of these errors. That's where the personalization comes in. I think you can reverse via personalization mm. uh, and language transfer as well. Um, mm. You can reverse. The key fundamentals, the fundamentals of the app, fossilization, yeah. dealing with it, personalization, uh, exaggerating it, and language transfer, trying to reduce yeah. it. So, yeah. if so, to use this for me, so it seems like someone using this app would be, it would be someone that's trying to reach that advanced level, you know, to be, I guess, you know, native. Uh, so, you know, this would be like someone that's trying to, you know, I guess, do a high band of IELTS or something like that that's that's really just kind of trying to, they don't kind of feel like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm there yet with my, with the English. I'm not just, you know, perfect with it, but it, it's helped punch through that. Uh, it, that's, that's kind of how, how it sort of seems to me. And I, I, th you know, I think it's commendable because it's not, my, not many people tackle that because it's so it, it's a difficult area to approach uh, especially with using an app and that's why it always seems to be f that all the apps tend to focus on that you know a lot of low level so mm. you know having an app mm. out there like yours that is specifically for higher level students you know mm. it is is interesting to say the so least. One of the, one, of the, one of the difficult, as I said before, Neil, one of the most difficult questions that, that I find to deal with with students is when they you know, um, how, how do I improve my listening comprehension uh, when they're not yet at the level where they can watch TV series, watch films, you know, they could even listening to podcasts and stuff can be very difficult when you're kind of A to B1. Uh, so that that audio aspect, I think, there's a lot of value to that, particularly if it gets a, if it if it presents something different than audio books, which um, which are the other sort of go to, aren't they, for teachers? Like, how do I improve my listening comp comprehension? Oh, I'll go and listen to some audio books, but then you get this very sort of unnatural. Um, unnatural kind of narrative uh, presentation. I mean, when it comes to audiobooks, there is a whole range of different narrative styles, although most of the time they do tend to be, you know, sort of over the top and, you know, uh, like sort of theatrical performance style yeah. narration. Um, but getting kind of more of a natural, you know, account of things, um, I think I think there's, uh, there's definitely some natural account of things which presents language such that context such that someone at a, a, an A2 or B1 language level can understand it. That seems that sounds like something that would be worthwhile. Um, well, I've been Neil of Team Teacher uh, China Fame. And if you're looking for more of my stuff, uh, have a look at teamteacherchina.com where we've got a whole bunch of materials that you can download and use instantly in the classroom. And we've got Team Teacher English where I take some of those 
materials and put them into animated self-study homework stuff for the kids. And we've got Team Teacher China YouTube channel as well, where we take that those materials and we walk you through how we use them. And Team Teacher Baby, where I take my experience as a teacher and put it into parenting. And we've got Professor Rich. Use the conversation for teaching stuff. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Profits Gaming for a bit of gaming streams. And you can email ELT, uh, ELT under the covers at gmail.com if you think you have something to contribute to come on the show and do an interview with us. Get in touch. <laughs> like, subscribe, share, email to all your friends and all the rest of it. And Catch Steve, you later. thank you very much for watching. Oh. Can you tell us how uh, someone watching this would be able to either get in touch with yourself, download the app, and you know, let us know how we get there? Well, the app is available for iOS and Android. I think if they type in Comify, they'll find it, or we'll put a link. How, how would you video. spell that? Uh, Comify, uh, K O M I. F-I-E-D, uh, and users, subscribers can also contact me on steve at comified.com or steve at englishcoachonline.com. That's fantastic. And we'll put a link below so we can direct you there instantly. I uh, highly advise you go check it out, especially if you're looking to take your English to that next level. We've not seen that many apps out there, if any, from my recollection, that kind of tackles this intermediate plateau so it's really good to check it out and you know give some give steve some support uh it's been wonderful having you on steve thank you for coming on and talking about uh your app and your experience teaching uh it's been a pleasure yep neil rich thanks very much it's been a pleasure of mine as well <laughs>